Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Thursday, September 24th, 2020. I am Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am Beth Johnson. And we're here to put space and astronomy in your brain. In today's top story, we have an update on the Event Horizon Telescope. Observations of the supermassive black hole uh, in the core of M87 in 2019, an amazing image of the glowing material and bent light twisting around this 6.5 billion solar mass black hole was released. That now iconic image was the result of one week of observations from April 2017 and used telescopes at seven different sites across the globe. That one observing run built on lower resolution successes of four prior observing sessions. But while they were at a lower resolution, that doesn't mean we couldn't use them for science. These observations were nonetheless good enough to capture some of the highlights of what is going on in the heart of this galaxy. And by highlights, I literally mean these images were able to capture the changing position of the hot spot in the ring. According to Thomas Kirchbaum, one of the researchers on this project, the data analysis suggests that the orientation and fine structure of the ring varies with time. This gives a first dynamical impression of the structure of the accretion flow, which surrounds the event horizon. Studying this region will be, a cru will be crucial for better understanding how black holes accrete matter and launch relativistic jets. These results are published in a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal with first author Masik Valgas. The press release related to the story explains, The gas falling onto a black hole heats up to billions of degrees, ionizes, and becomes turbulent in the presence of magnetic fields. Since the flow of matter is turbulent, the ring brightness appears to be glittering with time, which challenges some theoretical models of accretion. As always, the universe is weirder than we expected. Closer to home, we turn our attention from the new questions about Venus back to figuring out if we can find life on Mars. Researchers at Harvard and the Florida Institute of Technology analyzed the possibility of being able to find life or evidence of past life deep underground the surfaces of rocky worlds like Mars and the Moon. At the surface of those worlds, there is little to no atmosphere, and without at that atmospheric pressure, liquid water cannot exist. However, it has been established that there are subsurface lakes on Mars. Might these be able to sustain life? The answer is a resounding, possibly, Underground, the rock and soil above can create the pressure necessary to keep H2O in its liquid form. Since we know life on Earth generally needs water and we know there are extremophiles that thrive in very cold environments, the conditions underground could be just right for hosting life. In fact, according to noted Harvard scientist Avi Loeb, we found that the biological material limit might be a few percent that of Earth's subsurface biosphere and a thousand times smaller than Earth's global biomass. While that doesn't sound like a lot, it's still detectable. Although as Florida Tech professor, Dr. Manasavi Lingham noted, we know that these searches will be technically challenging, but not impossible. So for this week, at least, I'm hanging my hopes back on the Percy Rover finding evidence for life on Mars, even if it's only past life. From Nar Mars, we now turn, well, back to Earth and return to a story from last July that uh, highlighted how quantum mechanics is weird. Last July, the MIT LIGO Laboratory announced that they had successfully detected quantum fluctuations in the positions of the roughly 40 kilogram mirrors that are part of the gravitational wave detectors here in the U.S. These jitters in position are just 10 to the minus 20th of a meter an amount thousands of millions of times smaller than the size of a hydrogen atom. But they are large enough to place a limit on what kinds of gravitational waves can be detected. 
In a new paper in Physical Review Letters, Fausta Arkeens leads a paper replicating these quantum fluctuation measurements with the Virgo system in the European Union. As these 42 kilogram mirrors jitter, they make it impossible to detect low frequency gravitational waves. This is because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle forces researchers to make choices on where to put their accuracy. To expand what LIGO and Virgo can observe, new technologies that allow lower frequencies to be seen and that move the quantum noise to higher frequencies will be needed. Currently, frequency-dependent systems that will allow tuning are being developed and initial tests have already taken place. Here is to hoping that in the future we'll have tunable detectors that allow us to see both different sized quantum jitters and different frequencies of gravitational waves. Back out in the wider solar system, our own Planetary Science Institute announced a new timeline for the moons of Saturn. Generally, the age of rocky bodies in our solar system are determined by the cratering rates of the surface, how many craters are on the surface, and how often bodies are hit with impacts big enough to leave those craters. For the Moon and Mars, we know these numbers. However, for the moons of Saturn, we do not. So Institute scientist Sam Bell took a different approach. First, the accepted theory states that craters on these moons should be caused by objects that orbit the sun. Second, in accordance with that assumption, is that moons closer to Saturn will show evidence of more cratering due to Saturn's gravitational pull, bringing more objects closer to hit those moons. However, Bell found evidence that contradicted the second assumption. He explains, the crater densities of the oldest surfaces of Mimas, Tethys, Dion, Rhea, and Iapetus are all relatively similar. It would be too much of a coincidence for the ages of the oldest surfaces of each moon to, be, to vary by the exact amounts necessary to produce broadly similar crater densities. As a result, it seems much likelier that the impactors actually came from objects or, orbiting Saturn itself, moonlets that would be too small to detect with current technology. This new chronology changes how we think about the ages of Saturn's moons. If everything that impacted them had to orbit the sun, then the moons could not be less than 4 billion years old. With the impactors now orbiting Saturn, we create room in the chronology for younger moons, which goes along with observations of how their orbits have evolved. And as Bell notes, the assumption of impactors orbiting the sun results in the conclusion that the surface of Titan is probably at least 4 billion years old, even though Titan shows clear evidence of active weathering. With the new chronology, Titan could be quite young, which is much more observations of lakes, riverbeds, dunes, and mountains. Saturn continues to fascinate, and there is still more to learn about this beautiful planet and its system. This next bit isn't so much news as it is something cool for you to check out. Astronomers have been periodically trying to find ways to bring the beauty of the night sky to the visually impaired through a variety of different means. From 3D printed models, to textures being used to denote color, to images being translated to sound, a variety of different means have been used. Data sonification, which translates colors to notes and intensity to loudness, is one of the more popular ways of presenting astronomy non-visually. A new project combines data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Spencer Infrared Observatory, and translates the information in each set of colors into sounds. In the piece we're about to play, data from the center of the galaxy was translated. As the sonification scans through the image left to right, sound represents the position up and down in the image, and the brightness of sources is denoted by, well, the loudness of the pitches at those positions. We will link to this and other sonifications on our website, thedailyspace.org. All right, so this is a video of a sonification of the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant. And as the uh, uh, sound progresses, it is taking a cut through the image, starting at the center and moving out towards the outskirts of this system, allowing you to hear what this system looks like. Go ahead and play. 
play that one more time. Finally, it wouldn't be 2020 without me mentioning an asteroid or showing you a cat. Once again, a near-Earth asteroid was discovered mere days before it safely passed by Earth. This time, the asteroid in question was 2020 SW, and it was found by NASA's Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona on September 18th. It passed by Earth yesterday, September 24th, at an incredibly close distance of 22,000 kilometers which is actually below the ring of geostationary satellites that orbit at 36,000 kilometers. That's a little frightening. Don't be alarmed though. The asteroid is only the size of a small school bus, about five to 10 meters across. It would have broken up in the atmosphere and made a spectacular fireball in the process. Asteroid 2020 SW won't be back until 2041. And next time it will be much farther away from Earth. This has been The Daily Space.